Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Master Sergeant Stuart Quaid. At 10.48 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 31st, 1958, the attention of the American people was focused on Cape Canaveral, Florida, as a giant rocket was catapulted toward outer space. Few events in American history have been so awaited, prayed for, worked for, as the Army's successful launching of Explorer One. Today's big picture will reveal the dramatic, suspenseful story of how the Army, when the prestige of the United States throughout the world had been shaken by events beyond its control, stirred the hearts and emotions of the American people with an epic display of scientific and technical teamwork. Our story starts 84 days before the launching of Explorer One. The date, the morning of November 8, 1957 at Huntsville, Alabama. A sudden meeting has been called by General John B. Medeiros, Commanding General of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. Good morning, gentlemen. Be seated, please. I have a very important announcement for you. We've been assigned the mission of launching a scientific Earth satellite. And we will use the Jupiter-C configuration as a carrier that we developed along with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. Let's go, Werner. This is what they've been waiting for. The deadline is 90 days. 90 days to put a satellite into orbit. A crash program, an emergency. And the American people had become aware of that emergency long before when a Soviet Sputnik beep beeped its way across the skies. The reaction was one of astonishment and concern, for it was now known that a potential enemy was at least temporarily ahead in developing means for space travel. Reaction, counter-reaction. All at once, Americans were interested in the oncoming age of space. And with the curiosity came a mounting, swelling demand to get a satellite into the air on the double. But there were disappointments. It was an immensely difficult job. And the first American attempt with a Vanguard rocket was a failure. That was the background for the assignment to the Army Ballistic Missile Agency on November 8, 1957. Put a satellite into orbit within 90 days. There was no sense of panic, as the capability for doing the job had been ABMA since 1954. ABMA was a crack team headed by old pros of the missile field. Dr. Werner von Braun, director of the Development Operations Division, supervised over 3,000 scientists, engineers, and technicians with more years of practical experience than any similar group elsewhere. Long before a countdown starts at a launching pad, precise miniature replicas of the individual sections are made and subjected to numerous tests. And even the model work comes after a countless number of hours at the drafting tables. Each new experiment, each test means more knowledge, which may mean a change of design. There are often no precedents. It is creative work by creative men and women, absorbed in the fascinating problems of space flight. And it would be difficult to find a science which does not have something to contribute. Even as the research and design work, along with the incessant testing, goes on, the missiles take shape in the vast construction shops. In the development phase, no two missiles are alike. Each one contains changes and improvements on what has come before. All efforts are made to perfect the missiles quickly, but every day presents an obstacle course of unique problems. Even the welding, for example, involves special techniques needed to satisfy the very specific requirements of a missile. Now, added to the already numerous complications, the ABMA development team had the job of modifying an existing missile system for the purpose of achieving orbital capacity. 
the decision was passed down. Modify the Redstone ballistic missile, the Army's most powerful weapons carrier over a 200-mile range. Why the Redstone? It had proved itself again and again on the ABMA launching pads at Cape Canaveral, Florida. At Huntsville, Alabama, the steady success of the Redstone firings confirmed the feeling they were going to be the ones to put up a satellite. Work on modifications was accelerated around the clock. The tests of components, assemblies, everything that goes into the missile. Question, will a small piece of metal alloy withstand the hottest part of the rocket's exhaust? No guesswork. ABMA people have to know. The rocket's exhaust will be too much for the alloy. It melts. So they will develop a better one. But the final test at ABMA, the big one, where the results of thousands of tests are checked out, is the static firing. Held firmly in place, its rocket engines filled with fuel, the assembled missile is studied during full force firing. In the blockhouse sheathed in concrete where the operating controls and personnel are located, the countdown has started. A few seconds before firing, the water is turned on. 4,000 gallons a minute are required to cool the flame deflector of the test stand in this simulated flight, where the missile will stay right where she is. The countdown moves along to the fateful moment. The static test is over. The rocket is taken down and dried out. A closer examination of the rocket by observer teams will determine how various parts withstood the static test fire. The static firing was successful, and the modified Redstone, which would serve as the first stage of the satellite bearing rocket, was loaded aboard a plane. Stop, Cape Canaveral, Florida. But meanwhile, far across the country at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, a sprawling 80-acre research and development complex in Pasadena, California, scientists and engineers were racing toward the same deadline. 90 days to put a satellite into orbit. Their job, furnish the high-speed upper stages to take over after the first stage powered the satellite to the prescribed distance from the Earth. Thousand miles per hour. If all went well. The checkout on the JPL test stand went smoothly. But only the launching pad at Cape Canaveral, Florida would tell the story. The date, Wednesday, 29 January, 1958 eight days before the deadline set down by General Medaris. On the morning of the 29th, the weather was not good. The prediction was for thunderstorms and unsatisfactory jet stream conditions aloft. A 24-hour postponement was decided upon. The hours passed with the rocket crews working swiftly, intensively. But well, there is a whole set of operations to be completed at least 24 hours before the countdown starts. It was not until Friday, January 31st, that the weather cleared sufficiently for General Medaris to order launch at 10.30 p.m. Men worked on the lines, pipes, and servicing units on the pad. Others clambered about the various gantry levels. As is so often said in the Army, but rarely with more accuracy, 